in this lecture we're going to do another round of structural mechanics and we're going to look at um, a few other things regarding um, uh, time integration methods as well as we're going to look at um, large deformation versus small deformation assumptions and kind of start to just show uh, linear versus nonlinear uh, from a displacement standpoint, so we're not gonna, not going to do any material nonlinearity. Um, we're just going to look at like large deformations, um, and we're also going to start to see um, kind of the effect of your choice of mesh. Um, and so, the point of this lecture is to try to give some um, caution to those. Um, practitioners of finite elements. Um, you know, finite elements is a powerful tool, um, but like all power tools, it's important that you know um, their limitations and uh, considerations you have to take into effect when you're doing uh, analyses. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and open up Abacus. Now I'm going to have, or I'm going to provide online some of the the uh, geometry descriptions. We'll go ahead and we'll make a, we're gonna make a, a, a in 2D planar, we're gonna make a kind of a beam. Let's set this to that. And then let's go ahead and give ourselves our zero, zero. Fix it in place. Our two axes. And then we're going to make a beam that's going to be centered on the origin. And its length we're going to set to be 10. And its thickness we're going to set to be 0 0.1. Okay, so this is our beam. Okay, so we've defined the part. Now one of the things I'm going to go ahead and do is just that I kind of already know what kind of analyses I want to get off of this. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to partition this geometry. We're going to put uh, essentially a center line down both of its uh, primary axes. So we're going to divide it in half that way, and then in half this way. Okay, so you should have four sections. Go ahead and define our property. This is kind of a dummy property, but it kind of works out that it's approximately aluminum. Um, we're going to set a, a dummy density value for just some of our time integration schemes, 1e e minus 4. And then elasticity moduli 10e6 and Poisson ratio 0 0.33. Create our section. And I'm not going to go, I'm not changing any of the material names or section names or anything like that just to be able to get through this. Okay, so we've assigned our, our section uh, to our part. Go ahead and create this instance of this assembly. Or instance in the assembly. Again, we'll notice that it's centered now on the global coordinate system, zero, zero. Um, go ahead and do a step. So we're going to do multiple different um, integration schemes here. So we're going to do just our first one as implicit static. Um, and let's just for now, since we know, since I already know what we kind of want from a deformation out, we're going to go ahead and specify nonlinear geometry on so we can kind of see what, what our goal is. And then we'll leave the rest the same. Okay, and then we'll specify loads. So for this first case, we're going to essentially just pin this uh, um, um, uh, this beam. So we're going to pin on the left. And we're just going to hold a single point. 
and we're going to say that u1 and u2 are both zero. And then we're going to um, pin another point. We're not going to maybe pin, it's actually going to be a slide right. We're going to allow, um, we're going to specify this point now. We're going to allow it to slide in one, but we're going to hold it from being able to deflect in y. So by not specifying this, we're essentially letting this be a free uh, de uh, degree of freedom. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to specify a pressure on this face. And it's going to be a uniform pressure of 10 of uh, sorry, 1000. Okay. So our model has been set up. Let's go ahead and put a mesh on it. See what the default mesh looks like. First, let's go ahead and set this to a structured mesh. Okay, and we want to get a few more elements through this. So let's maybe take this into this to 0.125 for our seed size. Let's see where that gets us. Okay. And then let's go ahead and specify the number of elements on each of these surfaces to be two. And mesh this. 320 elements. We should be all dandy on number of nodes, but we'll just double check our mesh. 405 nodes were good from a student edition standpoint. Now, let's go ahead and model this as if this is a plain strain problem. So a very thick sheet. Let's go ahead and assign our element. And let's go ahead and call this plain strain. And I'm going to just, off the bat, I'm going to specify my element formulation to be CPE4I, so this incompatible modes option. Okay, so this should be what your element type looks like. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and run this job, but first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set this, I'm going to rename this uh, just to be, uh, I'll call it uh, beam bending, plus a static, um, and then we said the uh, elements, I think were CPE um, for I, and this is mesh one. Okay, and now let's go ahead and create this um, job, CP4, CPE4I mesh one. And then we'll go ahead and submit this job. Now, one of the things to point out is now in the monitor, We've seen jobs before where they've run in, say, a single, like a single increment. And what it was now that our our monitor is showing some different things to us. Uh, it's showing these things that say U, and that essentially means it unconverged or it's a non-converged solution. So it's had to do a cutback. So it wasn't able to solve it in one step. So it cut back by a quarter and tried to solve it there. And it has to do multiple cutbacks at different points. And so over 14 increments, we're finally able to solve this problem. So that's already giving us a hint that there are some challenges with solving this. And we can go through the message file and we can see those things again about checking for convergence and uh, having to cut back. Let's go ahead and take a look at the results. And so if we plot the deformed case or state, let's go ahead and fix our... Uh, um, uh, <coughs> legend and font sizes real quick okay and so if we play this we can see kind of this mode we can see that we're allowing this edge to slide again and then this kind of 
buckles up into a kind of a beam or uh, an arch. So if we just go to like the last frame and notice that our scale factor here is just 1.0. We can just double check, make sure it's going to stay at 1. So I just want you to take a look at what this um, deformation looks like. And you know, think about this problem. This is kind of a somewhat of a buckling problem in some sense, right? We've we've applied a moment by holding down the two ends and applying load. So there's already this kind of applied moment to this whole system. Um, so it's it wants to already deflect in a certain way. Um, but uh, just think about that um, in, in relation to the difficulty we had converging here. Now, what I want to do is I want to just show if we copy this model and we are going to use reduce integration, so we're going to go ahead and call this R. If we take our mesh and go from CPE for I to reduce integration, and if we run this model, Let's go ahead and create this job. BB implicit static. E four R mesh one. Okay, so we've converged on this solution as well. And if we take a look at the results for this model, let's go ahead and create a viewport. So we're going to create two viewports now. We'll tile these uh, maybe horizontally. And we'll turn this top one to our CP, uh, to our um, incompatible modes model. We'll go ahead and link the viewports together. And so now what we'll see is that as we change um, our views, they change together. And if we do a contour, they both modify their contour. And so already you can see that we have variation in our stress calculation. And you can also, you should be able to make out that there is a difference. Maybe it's a little bit clearer if we tile vertically, but there's a difference in the in the total deflection of both of these models. And if we go ahead and um, plot by displacement in the U2 direction, and we'll see some variation in our total deflection that we see. And so this is a problem that I want you guys to, to look into a little bit more. And if, just to think about, look at like mesh refinement uh, studies for this um, and see if you what kind of variation you get. I just want to show that the only thing we've changed with this model is an element formulation. Um, from reduced integration to incompatible modes. If we, and just to uh, kind of finish this thought, we can go ahead and do another copy and do just the standard um, quad mesh. So if we go to mesh and turn off the reduced integration, we can create this job. And submit it. Now we see this converged in a single step increment. So there wasn't any non convergence that occurred here. And let's go ahead to these results. 
Let's go ahead and create a new viewport. Again, we'll tile these vertically. Let's set this first one to uh, incompatible modes. And this last one is our seat is our normal element formulation. So we have incompatible modes, reduced integration, and standard. Again, we'll make sure that our viewports are all linked. Good, they're all linked. And now at the time at the same step with the same deformation factor. Now, if we look at, um, say, von Mises dress, we need to make sure that our viewports are all linked again. So we'll see that we've got now a very large disparity between von Mises dress. I mean, that's a factor of 10. That's a whole order of magnitude. And if we look at displacements, again, we see almost uh, somewhere between one and two orders of magnitude variation here. I mean, just clearly these are um, computing different displacement fields or displacements. So I just wanted this to be a word of caution uh, that your element formulations matter. Um, and there's something that you need to think about, and you, um, this is where being able to apply engineering judgment and hand calculations to make predictions about what you should be seeing can be useful. Although in nonlinear cases, hand calculations can be pretty difficult. And so oftentimes what you might do in a case like this is try to find some experimental data or other um, folks who have done simulations and try to compare your results and try to find what are the best kind of elements for a certain kind of analysis. Okay, so that's for that. What we're going to do is we're going to maybe try to stay with the uh, incompatible modes uh, element formulation. Um, and so let's go ahead and let's copy this model. Um, case B. So I'm going to have like a second a second type of load case. And what I recommend do is we're going to now kind of touch on some of the the uh, um, various time integration schemes. Um, and then I would recommend that you maybe try those out for these other ones which are maybe like case A. So we're going to go ahead and go to our loads. We have different loads in this case. Um, uh, what we're going to go ahead and, and do is uh, modify this boundary condition here. So this pin left, we're going to go ahead and call this uh, fix left. And then this was on a set one. So we can just go up to our tools and our set manager, and we can just straight up modify set one here to be this entire face. And then we're not going to have a slide right condition. What we're going to do instead is we're going to modify the set here to be this entire face. And I'm actually going to have two steps here. So um, uh, actually, we this is in just one step for now. Um, So what we're going to do is we're going to specify boundary conditions here where um, we're going to move this face minus 7.5 units and up one unit. Now notice that the amplitude right now is ramp. And so it's going to just linearly ramp the value from negative 7.5 to 1. So we should see some sort of deformation look something like this. Okay, and um, we're going to go ahead and keep our implicit static as our solver of choice. Let's go ahead and create this new job. Beam bending, implicit static, CBE4I, mesh1, case B. 
Maybe we'll call this ramp. And we'll go ahead and submit the job. Actually, before we do that, um, change of mind, we're actually going to use, um, for this problem, um, still in compatible modes, but we're going to use a hybrid formulation. So you can kind of get an idea for what this changes, but um, essentially we have a hybrid element that has linear pressure um, uh, as part of its formulation. So we're going to use that. Those tend to do a little bit better in some of the, like these kind of locking sort of cases, um, which we'll see shows up here. Um, we're also going to modify our step a little bit. Um, so this is a bit of a challenge for Abacus to, to crunch through. So we're going to give it some help by letting it take small steps. Abacus essentially tries to take large steps and it gets itself kind of backed into a corner. So we're going to tell it, hey, this is a really nonlinear problem, so you need to take small steps. And we'll go ahead and, and I've already created a job, and we'll submit this. Submit this job, and this job should run to completion. Okay, so the job has finished. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at the results. And so we'll play this video. Now I want you to really pay attention to here is just kind of the mode of deformation that we have here. So you can kind of see that we get this buckling with what? Uh, one, two, three, four, uh, four full wavelengths of buckling that happened as we move this uh, boundary up into the side and kind of accordions shut. And so let's go ahead and contrast that now um, with Boundary conditions. So I want to talk about boundary conditions real quick. So if we um, keep these, um, so just keep this mental model in your head. If we, so we'll go, go back to our step. Let's create a new step, call it step two. Um, and let's try to keep our same um, settings from the previous step. And now on our loads, we can have loads that occur in the second step as well. So let's take this um, slider. And actually, you know what? We meant to have, I meant to have this load turned off. So maybe before we do anything, let's just go back and, and rerun this, this model one more time. I thought I'd had that turned off, but apparently I hadn't. So let's go ahead and run this model. All right. Anyway, so we see that you know the modes of deformation are are still the same, and that makes sense because even though we were applying a pressure, um, we were really over enforcing it by having defining this displacement on this boundary here is really what was driving everything. Okay, so let's go um, back to our step. Let's go ahead and save our CAE since it looks like our computer is starting to slow down a little bit. Let's call this beam bending. I've already got one, so call it test one. 
So let's go ahead and turn that step back on. Um, and then on our loads, let's take this boundary condition, this slide right. So in this step, let's do this in two parts, where um, in the uh, first step, we don't specify, um, let's go ahead and let's, let's specify that there's no movement in X. We're just going to pull this up one unit. Okay, but we're going to leave it. Its face is going to essentially be flat. So we're just going to slide this top up. And then the next step, we'll go ahead and now we'll move it back to the 7.5 units. So recognize it at the end of this, when this, when this geometry ends, this boundary will be on the exact same spot as it was previously. But we're giving it a, but now we're loading it in a different path, but it's still a, an elastic material model. If we go ahead and submit this job. Hey, now that the job is finished, we'll go ahead and take a look at the results. Just remember that previous model that we'd run, and now compare to this model. So note that we pull this geometry up, and then we slide it, and now we really only have a single um, uh, wavelength in our solution. And so this is just want to point out that especially in nonlinear problems, that even with final solutions in static cases where your boundary conditions at the end should be the same, uh, the actual path to get there is important. And so this is just to highlight one of the major challenges with nonlinear analyses is in getting correct boundary conditions and accurate boundary conditions. And so let's go ahead and let's do um, let's go ahead and, and return um, to our modeling. And let's go ahead and let's run a, an explicit. Where are let's, let's do some implicit models first, some implicit dynamic uh, time integrators. Let's just call this implicit dynamic. And let's maybe call it uh, transient fidelity. So we'll go to the step. We'll replace it. We'll replace each of them. Um, and let's actually, um, let's turn off the second step. We're gonna do everything now just in this, uh, without this modified boundary condition. So dynamic implicit, nonlinear geometry is on. Um, and then we'll go ahead and let it pick its its own. So we'll set this to transient fidelity. And we'll let it take a, a few, we'll let it take a thousand steps. We'll just see how far along this simulation is able to get. We'll go back and mod, remodify our load um, so that we're at negative 7.5. And again, we don't have a step two, so we'll just deactivate those for step two. We'll create a job. We forgot to turn off this, because uh, we have the, sorry, we had the wrong um, step change here. So let's go back and remodify this. Um, transient fidelity. We submit. We'll just take a look at how far this simulation this simulation got. And again, we can see um, kind of again this multi-wave length. But notice here we're starting to get what is this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six wavelengths in this model or in this analysis. 
and we could change some parameters here and there and get this problem to solve. Um, um, but we're not going to go ahead and do that, although I may encourage you to play around with trying to get this transient fidelity model to converge. So now just even showing the difference between the static and the transient fidelity, we've had a difference in the results. Um, if we copy this model and we do an explicit dynamics, oops, wrong one, copy this one. And so explicit dynamics is, is also going to have real time for, you know, time will be seconds as opposed to like partial of a solve. Um, as we replace this to explicit dynamics, we make sure to change our mesh formulation. to the explicit family. I'll go ahead and submit, oops, wrong one. Create this new job, BB, explicit dynamics, CPE, and there is, it's just a standard CPE4, so there is no IH, mesh one, case B. And we'll run this in double precision. And let's make sure that we give ourselves, say, about 100 output frames. So look at. It. And we'll go ahead and submit. And so one of the things we also need to make sure we do is um, give ourselves a smooth uh, smooth step uh, amplitude for the displacements here. We'll let this uh, run in the background. But what I want to show real quick is if we go back to um, this uh, implicit static model that we had created with multiple steps. I want to show what happens. So just if we recall what this looked like um, for results. Um, let's see. So again, this was the general result we got out from this model. And so just, I want you to pay attention to the elements here. Look at, notice how the elements have each rotated. So these elements have very large rotations to them. And that's able to occur because we had nonlinear geometry set to on. If we choose to instead come in and set nonlinear geometry to off, And then we'll rerun this model, but we'll go ahead and call this um, uh, beam bending and plus static. And we'll call this um, small deformation, CPE for IH. And we'll go ahead and run this job. And then a couple things we can we can kind of see right away is that every single solve solves in a single step. There's essentially no nonlinear iterations that occur. And if we look at the results for this model, now look at the elements. The elements essentially have no rotation applied to them at all. There's shear that occurs, for sh certainly, but the elements themselves don't rotate. And that's essentially 
the big difference between the nonlinear geometry, linear geometry, and the or the small deformation and finite deformation approximations is the updating of the orientations of the elements and the contributions in the in their uh, stiffness uh, matrices. And so, again, this is a case where if you knew you were doing modeling of something that was undergoing this much deformation and rotation, or you might expect it might have some rotation that would be going on, this is where a linear um, simulation analysis is clearly not uh, suitable for this modeling. And so this is definitely a case where you need to have a non-linear non uh, solvers um, or solution technique and then pay real close attention to your boundary conditions as well as time integration schemes. We'll go ahead and take a look real quick at the explicit dynamic solve, which again is going to take quite some time to finish here. We're about 6% finished. Um, and we'll just go ahead and take a look. And so here we can start to see that a single kind of bending mode has begun. And the other thing to, uh, to note is that in this case where we're saying we're deflecting this over a second, that might actually be like the real physical time of your, of your event. And so at the end of the day, if you could run an explicit dynamic analysis for the exact true amount of time the simulation actually took to run, and you had your exact boundary conditions um, properly applied, you would expect that you would get out the true physical result. Um, and so in that regard, oftentimes explicit dynamics is kind of the ground truth. Um, but as you can see, they're also often incredibly expensive to get solutions from. So to kind of summarize some of the things to be looking for um, in assignments moving uh, on this, are to investigate the different time integration schemes, investigate different element uh, uh, types, and not just the formulations, but go ahead and give a look at tries um, as well as these quads. Um, and maybe try changing up your uh, mesh density, change up your meshing scheme from structured to a free mesh, um, and just kind of get an idea for um, the challenges that you face in nonlinear analyses.